Her crews called her the peacemaker. In nearly 10 years of frontline service, this remarkable strategic bomber, largest ever built for operational use, did not drop a bomb or fire a shot in anger. She was the U.S. Air Force's consolidated B-36. In early 1941, almost the whole of Europe had fallen to Hitler's blitzkrieg. As the air war raged over London between the Luftwaffe and the Royal Air Force, the survival of Great Britain itself seemed doubtful. Winston Churchill and the British people were barely hanging on. The Germans' partner, Japan, continued with its conquests in the Far East. The United States had to face the possibility that in case of war with the Axis, only bases in America would be available from which to strike the enemy. With this in mind, in April 1941, the Army Air Corps announced a design competition for an intercontinental bomber. At this time, the Air Corps main bomber was the obsolete twin-engine Douglas B-18. The advanced four-engine Boeing B-17 was just entering service. It was the product of a U.S. long-range bomber development program begun in 1934 with the Boeing XB-15 and continued with the Douglas XB-19, which first flew in June 1941. Consolidated Aircraft Corporation of San Diego, California, was building the B-24 Liberator four-engine bomber. First deliveries had been made. The company had won a prototype contract in September 1940 for its XB-32. That model design was first refined and then enlarged to six pusher engines. In October 1941, the Air Corps contracted for two prototypes, designated XB-36. They also ordered prototypes of Northrop's competing XB-35 flying wing. The attack on Pearl Harbor caused the Air Corps to shift Consolidated's priorities to B-24 production. Mock-ups of the XB-36 were built in San Diego and then in August 1942 moved by rail to a new government plant in Fort Worth, Texas operated by Consolidated vault -T, later known as Convair. Work on the XB-36 was slow because of the need to produce first B-24s and then B-32s. But plans for its production were given priority and a contract for 100 was placed in July 1943. World War II ended in August 1945. By this time, the original XB-36 design had been changed to a single tail. It had a circular 163-foot-long pressurized fuselage, a 230-foot wingspan, six pusher engines, and a gross weight of 278,000 pounds, making it the heaviest aircraft ever built. The XB-36 was planned to carry almost 19,000 gallons of fuel. The pusher arrangement kept the propellers from interfering with airflow over the wing. The wing itself, set high on the fuselage, was six foot thick at the root and allowed crewmen access to the engines in flight. The first XB-36 prototype was rolled out September 8, 1945. The aircraft was only 80 percent complete. The Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines still had to be tested and mounted, along with their 19 foot diameter Curtis props. Post-war U.S. air strength declined dramatically. Aircraft and air personnel of the Army Air Forces were speedily demobilized in great numbers. Thousands of aircraft were cocooned for possible future use, while thousands of others were either sold or broken up for their metal. From a powerful wartime force of two million men, our air personnel dropped to about one-seventh of that strength. Our recuperative powers remained but our great strength in the air was suddenly hardly more than a memory. 
American air power had played a great part in the winning of World War II. U.S. air forces had proven the concept of strategic bombardment. Our long-range aircraft had destroyed the enemy's capacity and will to fight, first with conventional bombs and then with atomic weapons. Our victories in the war had been complete. Still, some of our leaders knew we had better look to the future. One of them was General Hap Arnold, commanding general of the Army Air Forces. We must be sure that none of these victories is wasted and thrown away in the years to come. There will no longer be any spot on Earth, and certainly not in America, that is safe from attack by air. For our protection, we must have an Air Force second to none. For this, we need a great aviation industry. On August 8, 1946, the XB-36 was ready for its first flight, nearly five years after it was ordered. With nine crewmen, including pilot Burl A. Erickson, the unarmed prototype lifted off for a short, wheels-down test flight. This and further test flights soon showed that many mechanical difficulties would have to be overcome before the aircraft would be ready for service. The XB-36 was much larger and much more complex than the Air Force bombers it was to replace. The prototype's large single main wheels were 110 inches in diameter. To solve visibility problems, Convair developed a bubble-type cockpit canopy. General Electric delivered more efficient engine turbo superchargers, upping horsepower considerably. A four-wheel landing gear using 56-inch diameter tires was developed for the YB-36 and B-36As. The first production B-36A flew August 28, 1947. Twenty-two aircraft were eventually built in this configuration. They were unarmed and used principally for training and crew conversion. The first B-36As began to be delivered to the 7th Bombardment Wing of the Strategic Air Command, SAC, at Carswell Air Force Base. SAC, created the previous year, was commanded by General George C. Kenney. The only SAC unit capable of delivering atomic weapons was the B-29 equipped 509th Composite Group, but the U.S. did have the atom bomb. Since the end of World War II, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union had grown increasingly tense. Stalinist Russia continued to build up and parade its military might for the world to see. America and the West could only look on with dismay as the Cold War deepened following communist takeover after takeover. With World War II B-29s as the backbone of its strength, and with insufficient manpower, overseas bases, or equipment, the Strategic Air Command was hardly the powerful force to deter aggression that its founders envisioned it to be. But like the rest of the Air Force, SAC had to make do until its new B-36s, a truly intercontinental modern long-range bomber, could become operational. The second prototype, the YB-36 was ready to be rolled out of Convair's assembly building at Fort Worth in the fall of 1947. Except for its single wheel main gear, the YB was identical to the A's following it off the line. President Truman authorized creation of the Air Force as an independent branch. W. Stuart Symington became first secretary of the Air Force and General Carl Spotts was named chief of staff. As the U.S. Air Force came into being, development of the B-36 became synonymous with it. The B-36 was by far the largest item in its budget. The first 95 production models had been ordered at a unit cost of over $6 million, and the total program cost was estimated at over a half billion dollars. The second prototype, designated YB-36, was completed. 
Convair test pilot Ericsson took it into the air for the first time December 4, 1947. With the faster B-50s and the all-jet B-47s now in service, critics of the expensive peacemakers argued that it should be canceled. But production of B-36As continued at Convair Fort Worth. A B-36C design with variable discharge turbine engines had been proposed, but when it became clear that it would be slower than the B-36B, the B-36C project was dropped. Suddenly the Soviets reacted, clamping a blockade on all land traffic to and from Berlin. The date, June 22, 1948. The isolated city was cut off by land from West Germany. As B-36As were completed and accepted at Fort Worth Army Airfield, now known as Carswell Air Force Base, they were sent to Tinker Air Force Base Modification Center, Oklahoma. Tinker became a major B-36 supply and maintenance center. The 7th Bomb Wing of SAC's 8th Air Force, based at Carswell, was to be the first unit to receive B-36s. 8th Air Force commander was Brigadier General Roger M. Ramey. Lieutenant Colonel John D. Bartlett was project officer. Carswell soon became a hub of activity as the men of the 7th began learning how to operate the B-36. For many months, the new peacemakers mixed with the wing's old B-29s on the flight line as the switchover gradually took place. B-36A deliveries to the 7th Bomb Wing came slowly but steadily at the rate of one per week. The wing built up its squadrons and B-29s gradually began to disappear from the flight line to make room for the larger peacemakers, which dwarfed the superfortresses. Transition flight training began. Colonel Bartlett, with a plane load of young pilots, would take off and fly every day possible. The men of 7th Wing were proud of their unit and proud that they had been selected to pioneer operation of the world's largest bomber for SAC. More and more flight crews completed transition training. After they got used to its size, the pilots found the Peacemaker an easy plane to fly. Classroom training was conducted for the men by the Air Training Command. Training aid exhibits prepared for the Air Force by Convair were used to demonstrate important features of B-36 operation and maintenance. General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, the new Air Force Chief of Staff, and his top generals reviewed the controversial B-36 program. This series of meetings resulted in the Air Force deciding to stand by the B-36, satisfied by Convair's test flights and by the initial training missions being made by 7th Wing. General Vandenberg brought Lieutenant General Curtis E. LeMay back from Europe to take over the Strategic Air Command. In October, SAC headquarters shifted to Offutt Air Force Base, Omaha, Nebraska. We must train constantly to achieve bombing accuracy and to maintain the greatest possible number of airplanes ready for instant action at all times. Everything in this command is dedicated to placing bombs accurately on enemy industrial areas and other targets in the shortest possible time. SAC is a global striking force. To us, the only difference between peace and war is where we place our bombs. It takes a lot to get airplanes over a target. Train crews, maintenance, supply support. General LeMay ordered a rigid schedule of training missions for the Carswell-based B-36s. The ground and flight crews of 7th Bomb Wing redoubled their efforts to master the giant six-engined bomber. Engines on the armed B-36Bs then being delivered were the more powerful Wasp Majors with water injection. Her main function was to carry bombs, but she went up well armed with eight gun turrets, each mounting two 20-millimeter cannon that could fire explosive shells as well as armor-piercing projectiles. That was more and better armament than any other bomber ever had. 
the bees featured ANANQ-24 bombing navigation radar and ANAPQ-3 gun laying radar in the tail. The Peacemaker was the only U.S. plane capable of carrying the atomic bomb to distant targets and return without refueling. It had the longest range of any bomber in the world at the time. Air Force leaders sorely needed to have this intercontinental aircraft ready for action. Following his historic whistle-stop campaign, in November 1948, President Truman was elected to a four-year term. For his inauguration, a massive display of American air might, including B-36s, flew over the Capitol. President Truman attends the Air Force's demonstration of progress in air power at Andrews Field, Maryland. He sees the latest in aerial weapons. Once, he inspected planes as head of the wartime Truman Committee. Now he's the commander-in-chief of the world's largest air force. With Air Force General Hoyt Vandenberg, the president watches the takeoff of the flying wing, the ultimate in bombers. General Eisenhower is also present as the giant XB-47 bomber roars into the air. of heavy bombers, American progress in air power. At Carswell, 7th Bomb Wing had been reorganized and a 7th Bomb Group reactivated. The 11th Bomb Group had been reactivated and assigned to the wing as the second B-36 outfit. Colonel Bartlett made headlines with a spectacular 9,600-mile round-trip flight. Some B-36Bs appeared with painted tails and wingtips. Nicknamed red-tailed beauties, they were marked for Arctic test visibility. From Washington, the barrage of criticism against the B-36 had grown furious by mid-1949. Inter-service squabbling at the Pentagon had grown vicious. Certain Navy admirals called the B-36 a sitting duck, a billion-dollar blunder, too slow to evade the new Russian MiG-15 jet interceptors. The Air Force generals retorted that the supercarriers the Navy wanted would be easy targets for enemy submarines and land-based bombers. A congressional investigation of the entire B-36 program was ordered. The hearings also addressed charges of political favoritism against Defense Secretary Lewis Johnson, who had served on Convair's board of directors. But the B-36 survived the investigation. For more speed and altitude, the B-36D would have a pair of turbojet engines mounted under each wing. The prototype flew July 11, 1949. Its improved performance led the Air Force to order more peacemakers and to convert the unarmed B-36As to RB-36E strategic reconnaissance models. 36 more new RB-36Ds were added to production plans, and modification of all B-36Bs to jet pod configuration was authorized. On September 23, 1949, President Truman reported news that shocked and dismayed all America. President Truman's dramatic announcement that Russia had the atom secret caused State Departments all over the world to stir uneasily. At the United Nations, Soviet representative Andrei Vyshinsky refused to comment and stalked coldly into the assembly building. The grim vision of an atomic war, which would leave complete desolation in its wake, is a problem that deeply affects nearly all deliberations of the international forum. John Q. Citizen wonders what happens now. At Carswell, the two SAC B-36 groups were now under even more pressure to prove the big six-engine long-range bomber's capabilities. The first fatal crash of a B-36 occurred at Fort Worth after more than 5,000 hours of safe flights over two years. 
A third B-36 unit had been designated, the 28th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing, based at Rapid City Air Force Base, South Dakota, began receiving B-36Bs. They started training with these until their RB-36Ds would arrive. Each B-36 group of three squadrons was assigned 30 bombers, 10 per squadron. General LeMay had resolved to build SAC into the toughest, most professional fighting force in U.S. military history. He imposed a brutal schedule of training on his airmen. Each SAC unit had to go through a grueling round of proficiency exercises. Work weeks of 70 or 80 hours were routine. Every morning, ground crews would run through an exhaustive checklist on the aircraft assigned to them. Flight crews were engaged in round-the-clock exercises, some lasting 24 hours, that simulated attacks on Soviet targets. Brigadier General Clarence S. Bill Irvine became commanding General 7th Bomb Wing and CO at Carswell in January 1950. More training missions to Ladd Air Force Base Fairbanks, Alaska were flown in February to test the B-36 under severe winter conditions. The Cold War with the USSR continued to heat up. Letting the world know that it already possesses the atom bomb has continued its provocations. An urgent necessity in rebuilding the U.S. Air Force was to revive the aircraft industry, whose output had diminished alarmingly in the first years after the war. By carefully allocating the funds allowed it by Congress, the Air Force was able to distribute initial orders for 2,000 new planes among certain key manufacturers. One of the most famous of the post-war models has been the giant B-36. Peacemaker production accelerated. As they were rolled out, B-36s had to be tilted for the tail to clear the door. Development continued. As an experiment, the XB-36 was fitted with a track-type landing gear to reduce ground pressure. But following flight tests, that idea was abandoned. Special pods were mounted on either side of the fuselage of a test B-36. These were the type of pods used to carry spare engines on long-distance flights. To distinguish between the two peacemaker groups at Carswell, an identification letter was painted inside the 8th Air Force Triangle on tails. A J for the 7th, a U for the 11th. A few crashes of B-36s continued to occur as the SAC combat readiness training schedule went on relentlessly. The first RB-36D was completed and accepted months before the bomber version. It entered service with the 28th at Rapid City Air Force Base, later called Ellsworth Air Force Base. Their aircraft were marked with an S inside the tail triangle. Halfway around the world in Asia, peace was about to be shattered in the ancient land of the morning calm. The uneasy peace that had existed since VJ Day finally flared into war when communist North Korean forces invaded the Free Republic of South Korea, crossing the 38th parallel. They didn't look for any active intervention by the United States or other nations. That was the Reds' big mistake. From Washington, two days after the invasion began, came President Truman's order that American air and sea forces were to go to the help of South Korea. Aircraft of the United States Far East Air Forces were sent at once to operational bases. With the Pentagon ordered to put the nation's military on a war footing, the 7th and 11th bomb groups accelerated training, received additional aircraft, and flew more and more simulated combat missions. Morale was improving greatly at Carswell. Maintenance and supply problems were starting to diminish. Solutions were being worked out by the men themselves to many of the mechanical difficulties. Reliability of the B-36's systems improved. Valuable ground and air crew training experience was gained. 
General LeMay's training program made it clear that the responsibility for operating efficiency lay with the airmen. He did not tolerate failure. The general instituted a rating system in which crewmen were carefully evaluated. This is the mighty B-36D, SAC's intercontinental bomber of today. It's higher than a four-story house and has a wingspan almost as long as a city block. It's four jets and six pusher-type conventional engines, which give it the horsepower of nine locomotives, push it through the air at better than 435 miles per hour. More than 27 miles of wiring are required in the electrical system, equal to the amount needed to wire 280 five-room houses. The B-36 had six piston engines of 3,800 horsepower each, and four jet engines each capable of 5,200 pounds of thrust at takeoff. The big bomber had a much greater carrying capacity than any other aircraft so far produced. There was room in the four big bomb bays for 100 500-pound bombs, or when tremendously big ones were needed, the cargo could be two bombs, each weighing 21 tons. its fuel load of 21,000 gallons, the B-36 had tremendous range, 10,000 miles without refueling, and a combat radius of more than 4,000 miles. The B-36D carried a crew of 15. The aircraft commander, two pilots, two engineers, navigator, bombardier, two radio operators and an observer were forward. Linked by a pressurized tunnel, the rear compartment accommodated five gunners. While in the air, off-duty crewmen could sleep in hammocks or bunks or cook meals on the grill. More B-36Ds were being completed at Fort Worth. Snap-action bomb doors were introduced on this particular model. The first B to complete conversion to full D standard flew in November 1950. The B-36F, similar to the D, but with more powerful 3,800 horsepower engines, had its first flight. 28 were being built, plus 24 similar RB-36Fs with increased fuel. In spite of the Korean War, SAC continued to demonstrate its capability by sending its bombardment aircraft to other parts of the world. The B-36D was first deployed overseas in January 1951, when 7th Wing aircraft flew to the United Kingdom on a simulated mission lasting more than 24 hours. With Bombay tanks, the B-36 had an unrefueled endurance of more than 50 hours. More and more B-36Ds, converted from A's or fresh off the factory assembly line, were accepted. Additional SAC groups received the long-range bomber. Several 15th Air Force units, identified by their circular tail markings, got the peacemaker. Ground crew and maintenance men grew more and more proficient in keeping the big B-36s combat ready and airworthy. And deliveries of the RB-36 recon version picked up. Reconnaissance airplanes are also part of SAC. Their job is to provide pre- and post-strike data, weather, and other information. The RB-36 is equipped with 14 different cameras one with an enormous telephoto lens. The RB-36Ds also carried extra fuel tanks, 
flash bombs, and extra ECM equipment. The crew originally consisted of 18, two pilots, engineer, photo navigator, radar navigator, weather observer, radio ECM operator, photographer technician, three ECM operators, a tail gunner, and six relief crew gunners. B-36s were famed for their safety record, but when the big planes did crash, the result was often spectacular. On May 28, 1952, this 11th bomb wing B-36F came in too low landing. The fire burned for hours. Happily, most of the crew survived. This B-36F of the 11th had its main gear collapse while parked at Carswell. On September 1, 1952, disaster struck at Fort Worth. A tornado ripped across the flight line at Carswell, knocking out 71 B-36s, almost half of SAC's heavy bomber force. 51 were back in service five weeks later. Thanks were due to a round-the-clock effort by consolidated workers and by Air Force ground crewmen and repair personnel. The first B-36Hs had been accepted. Differing mainly in internal details, changes included an improved bombing system, relocation of components, and a completely rearranged flight deck. It was announced that the U.S. had detonated a so-called thermonuclear device. In the November 1952 voting, Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected president by landslide. As his administration took charge in 1953, new Secretary of State John Foster Dulles spoke of defense policy. Our capacity to retaliate must be, and I assure you it is, massive. The instrument of massive retaliation was to be the B-36 bombers of the Strategic Air Command. They were the first global bombers, kept in the air around the clock. On the power of the B-36s rested the security of the cities of the United States. On the Soviet belief that they would be used, rested the deterrence of any Soviet move against the West. Being one of the most complicated engines of war ever built, the B-36 needed a crew of 16 specialists. Every one of them was a man of great experience and skill. And they worked together for long periods and achieved a high degree of teamwork. It was an honor to be picked as a member of a B-36 crew. And the men who flew the big bomber came to admire her. On July 28, 1953, at Panmunjom, Korea, an armistice was signed. The shooting war there stopped. Once again, a watchful, uneasy quiet fell across the 38th parallel. SAC continued to display its range and mobility. B-36s had been deployed to England. The 11th bomb wing flew its B-36s to North Africa. Operation Big Stick was the first mass flight of B-36s to the Far East. Aircraft from the 15th Air Force's 92nd Bomb Wing from Fairchild Air Force Base, Spokane, Washington, deployed to Japan, Okinawa, and Guam during August 1953. Coming immediately after the end of hostilities in Korea, the move reaffirmed U.S. willingness and ability to protect its interests in the Pacific. Temporarily based at Anderson Air Force Base, Guam, the 92nd spent three months on the island. The importance of and need for the Strategic Air Command became even more obvious after it was revealed that the Russians had also exploded a thermonuclear device. Our strategy is based on the assumption that we have a great capacity to counter instantly by means and at places of our own choosing to make the penalty of aggression certain, prompt, and severe.
In February 1954, Operation North Star in Alaska subjected B-36s to 40 degrees below zero. Around each commander is tailored a 16-man flight crew. They are trained for weeks in ground school work and on the B-36 assembly line. The combat crew is the backbone of SAC, and much attention is given to the intensive training of each crew as a unit. In these days of atomic weapons, one crew and one airplane can destroy an objective which formerly required 300 World War II aircraft launched from forward bases. High order teamwork and complete compatibility is the aim, and SAC crews achieve it with hard, intensive training, long hours, short leaves, and missed holidays. In compliance with 7th Bomb Group, Operations Order 38-50, the 9th Bomb Squadron will drop five bombs on the Suarita bombing range. Aircraft will proceed on course to Point Barrow, Alaska. And return via Minneapolis to Carswell Air Force Base. One radar record run will be made over Minneapolis. Predicted length of mission is 29 hours and 16 minutes. Simulated post-strike reconnaissance mission will be flown by the 28th Strategic Reconnaissance Group. And film will be delivered to SAC headquarters. Takeoff time is as listed in the pilot's flimsy, 0900. And specialized briefing. Preparing to spend 30 or more hours in the air six miles above the earth is an everyday occurrence at SAC bases, but nobody ever takes it lightly. Exacting preparation before takeoff is the best assurance of a safe return. Clothes, boots, oxygen masks and parachutes make up some of the necessary personal equipment. Since most SAC missions fly over all areas of the world, each airplane carries survival equipment for forced landings at sea or in the jungle, desert, or arctic wastelands. Winter parkas, arctic survival kits, May Wests, fishing equipment, snow axes, and mosquito nets go aboard. Each crew member personally inspects the equipment for which he is responsible. Before they set foot on the ground again, they will have flown the equivalent of one-fourth the way around the world. A visual check of the airplane is part of a rigid system established to make sure the airplane is ready for flight. The flight engineers visually check the hydraulic system. With a second pilot to assist him, the airplane commander makes a final inspection. gallon of coffee and 15 sandwiches later, aircraft 0643 approaches the Suarita bombing range. Primarily, SAC bombers bomb by radar, but constant training in visual bombing is also important. The criterion of ability in SAC is bombing accuracy. A new crew is under training until they can find and hit targets with accuracy. A crew that's combat ready has made the first team. But no crew can rest on its laurels. Under the stiff, competitive system used throughout the organization, 
Resting on past accomplishments is a sure way to get sent back to the bush leagues. Here's the target as the bombardier sees it, about the size of a pinhead, and he's six miles above it. Bombs away. That's the kind of accuracy SAC is proud to achieve. The U.S. exploded a hydrogen bomb at Bikini Atoll. This is the reason for the B-36's existence, an airdropped hydrogen bomb. The SAC badge, along with the star-studded medium blue band, became the standard marking on the left noses of B-36's. SAC demanded a remarkable degree of mobility and flexibility from its units. Squadrons and even wings had to be ready to pack up and move 5,000 or more miles away for days or months. They had to take with them essential unit equipment and maintenance personnel. This is the squadron CO speaking. One hour ago, we received orders to move out of here within 36 hours. Our mobility plan was put into effect immediately. Each man has a pre-assigned job to do, and he's been thoroughly trained to handle it. The backbone of SAC mobility is the flyaway kit. The kit for our group is made up of two bins per airplane, plus essential items too large to be placed in the bins. The bins contain spare parts that will be needed to keep our airplanes going for 30 days or 100 hours of combat. When the word comes to go, these bins are moved out of storage for loading. Each item of equipment has a priority number and is loaded according to a plan. There is also a medical flyaway kit. Some of our airplanes will carry engines, spares in case we need them. Spare engines are quickly hoisted aboard. Meanwhile, military air transport service airplanes arrive to help carry out the move. The C-124, MAT's newest cargo carrier, is built and equipped for rapid loading and unloading. A large stock of tools, supplies, and parts is loaded aboard this MATS plane to be flown to the new base. Mobility also applies to our personnel. SAC men have learned through experience to keep themselves ready to move on a moment's notice. Peacemaker units continued to fly to Guam for a 90-day rotating deployment. Project Featherweight was a program which reduced B-36 weight to gain more speed, altitude, and range. Class II featherweights kept all their guns, but those designated Class III had all turrets and fire control systems removed except for the tail guns. The swept wing all-jet Boeing B-47 and RB-47 was now in frontline service with a number of SAC groups. Although considerably faster than the B-36, it did not have the bigger bomber's range or its operational ceiling or load-carrying ability. It could not reach Moscow without refueling. SAC's B-36 strength peaked in December 1954 with 10 wings of 209 B-36s and 133 RB-36s. Fort Worth had completed B-36 production. Total deliveries amounted to 383 aircraft, including the two prototypes. Average cost was $3,776,000 each. The nuclear standoff between the Soviet Union and the U.S. went on. The Strategic Air Command continued to rely heavily on the Peacemaker 
as its main H-bomb carrier. The prototype B-52 first flew in 1954. By early 1955, the Boeing Stratofortress all-jet heavy bomber arrived in SAC to begin replacing B-36s. Reconnaissance versions of the buff also gradually replaced the RB-36s. Although delivery of new aircraft had ended, the SAM-SAC program, Specialized Aircraft Maintenance Strategic Air Command, returned each B-36 to the latest configuration. This process was to continue for several more years. Throughout 1956, SAC's big stick was still the peacemaker. B-36s took off night and day to fly training missions thousands of miles. With six turning and four burning, regardless of weather, they headed out to attack American cities under conditions approaching the real thing. In-flight meals were served. These long peacemaker missions, the airmen joked, were a sure cure for insomnia. The B-36 droned on and on, hour after hour, for thousands of miles. Thirty-five thousand feet above the friendly countryside, nerves grow taut of the unseen bomber. Temperature 50 degrees below zero. Wind velocity 100 miles per hour. Below is the target, concealed from human eyes by what military men once called protective weather. On the outskirts of the city, a strange group of trailers squat in the middle of a frozen field. This is a radar bomb scoring detachment. Their job is to determine the accuracy with which the approaching bomber drops its simulated atom bomb. Inside, two men watch their radar scopes. That bright spot toward the outer edge of the scope is the approaching airplane. Now they've got it. Their job's to stay on it. Ranges and bearings feed automatically from the radar set to bomb plots. When the airplane reaches its bomb release point, it will release not a bomb, but a radio signal. These men will compute the accuracy of the drop. Hello, Minneapolis bomb plot. This is 0643. We are starting a run. Over. Roger, 0643. Cut in steady radio tone signal. Signal stopping indicates bomb release. To the bomber crew in the sub-zero blackness six miles overhead, and to the nation they work tirelessly to protect, this mission is as serious as if they carried an atom bomb above an enemy industrial area. To them, training and the real thing are one and the same, for they're convinced of the importance of their job. Teamwork achieved today will pay big dividends tomorrow. Only an atom bomb in the bomb bay of this airplane is lacking, and that can be loaded if need be. This bomber crew knows that in enemy countries, factories like this supply their forces with weapons of destruction. Roger, out. Mission accomplished. Now to compute the accuracy of the drop. A direct hit. Accidents sometimes happened on these training flights, and airmen were sometimes killed, even if it was peacetime. This RB-36F lost its rudder over Lowry Air Force Base, but landed safely. 
The featherweight reduction program continued, and so did SAC B-36 practice missions. An airplane commander is usually a seasoned old man of 29 years. For all practical purposes, the airplane belongs to the commander and his crew. When it's on the line, at least one crew member is on hand to see what's being done. Around each commander is tailored a 16-man flight crew. They are trained for weeks in ground school work and on the B-36 assembly line. Taxi outs and takeoffs were timed and executed with great precision. The latest and more powerful model B-36Js equipped most of the SAC Peacemaker groups now. And the combat radius of more than 4,000 miles. Even at great altitude, and at more than 400 miles an hour, the B-36 was a steady flying platform, a stable and accurate bomber. Over the target. With its speed, armament, and high altitude capability, the B-36 became the Strategic Air Command's Sunday punt. It gave the Air Force one of its best means of winning friends and influencing people. Largely because of this aircraft, the Strategic Air Command was the first military organization in history that could assault the heart of a remote enemy country from stateside bases within hours after the outbreak of a war. The last year a B-36 would win the Strategic Air Command Fairchild Trophy for bombing accuracy was 1956. SAC had become a sharply honed instrument of peace and a successful deterrent to aggression. In 1957, General Thomas S. Power succeeded General LeMay as commander of SAC. Throughout its history, the Peacemaker had inspired a number of experimental designs and modifications. In 1942, the Air Force ordered a prototype cargo plane designated XC-99 with the same engines, wing, and landing gear as the XB-36. It had the largest fuselage ever planned for a land plane, a double-deck pressurized structure capable of holding 400 fully equipped troops. The XC-99 was completed and flown on November 24, 1947. No production contract was placed. During the Korean War, the XC-99 was used as a cargo transport. In 1950, two prototypes of a swept wing design with eight jet engines were built, designated YB-60s. After test flights in 1952 showed this proposal to be inferior to the B-52, it was scrapped. FICON Fighter Conveyor was a project intended to provide the B-36 with its own fighter that it would carry into combat. The first such project involved the McDonald XF-85 Goblin. That didn't work. Convair received a contract for a FICON system to carry and retrieve a Republic F-84 jet fighter. That did work, and Convair received a contract to build these aircraft. Each of the modified B-36s carried an H-shaped cradle in its bomb bay lowered to retrieve or to launch the parasite, and raised to relieve the pilot or refuel the aircraft. By the end of 1955, these composites, called GRBs, were in service. Another take-along fighter program called TomTom Tom had been tried. Parasite F-84 fighters were attached to B-36 wingtips. Tests were successful, but this sort of hookup was extremely dangerous. In late 53, Tom Tom was terminated. Between 1953 and 1955, three B-36Hs were modified to carry the Bell Rascal air-to-ground missile. Another B-36 was modified to serve as a mothership for drop tests of Consolidated's F-106 Delta Dart. A peacemaker designated the NB-36H was modified to test airborne shielding of personnel and equipment with a small nuclear reactor aboard. The flight crew's compartment was completely shielded from radiation. Test flights were made from 1955 to 1957.
Sack's last B-36, which was also the last one built, was retired February 12, 1959, the command becoming an all-jet bomber force that day. It is said that the best weapon is the one you never have to use. That was certainly the mighty peacemaker, Consolidated's B-36.